people that I'm seeing at the moment that are making good money investing in property are the ones that are prepared to buy and hold, yeah. right, for a start, because at the end of the day, there's no quick capital growth in Adelaide in the last few years, no. only in some very few locations. Mm. Um, and number two, they're very, very ruthless about the number in which they purchased the property for. Yes. They don't get carried away. Welcome to the Get Invested podcast, where we share conversations I've enjoyed with experts from all walks of life to uncover their secret know-how on where they invest their time, their skills, and their money, and the benefits this has created. Get Invested helps you to live more, work less, and leave a legacy by investing now. Listen to the show to discover the top tips on how to get started, to make the most of your investment journey, and ultimately, more episodes can be found on iTunes or at khgroup.com.au forward slash get invested. Thanks for listening and let's get invested. Welcome Freedom Fighters and today I've got the job of a lifetime for you. If I was to offer you a job where you have to work seven days a week, 10 to 12 hours a day, where you have to cold call, knock on doors, suffer constant rejection and knockbacks, you're constantly getting people hanging up and slamming the door on your face. And then everything is a hard negotiation between two parties that have completely opposing expectations and you only get paid on a success commission basis so that you're very unlikely to make any money for at least a couple of years. Does that sound interesting? Are you excited? You're still interested? Well, this is the life of the average real estate salesperson. And when you add in the fact that most of us have a basic mistrust of real estate salespeople, and we all think that we're property experts just because we happen to live in one, and you have a very challenging work environment. But despite all this, there are still those who have the passion, the persistence, and the resilience to rise to greatness in this very challenging industry. And today's guest is one of those. You're really going to enjoy Tom Hector. He's a self-professed prospecting machine. He successfully sold over 200 properties in the last 12 months. And he's been a finalist in the salesperson of the year here in South Australia for the four years running from 2013 to 2016. He's now in a position where he's the go-to person for property in Adelaide's northeast and eastern suburbs. And he's now in that very rare position after less than 10 years to not have to work Sundays and enjoys half a day off during the week, which is a very rare luxury for a real estate salesperson. So in today's very high energy conversation, we learn the key things to consider when selecting a selling agent where the future investment opportunities are in Adelaide and what sort of properties to buy and not to buy. So please sit back and enjoy our very entertaining chat with Tom Hector. Welcome back Freedom Fighters, it's Bushy Martin here from Get Invested and today we've got the real pleasure of spending some time with Tom Hector. Now I've been very fortunate to know Tom for some years now. He's a local legend in the real estate industry here in South Australia and he's been good enough to give, give us some of his time so great to talk to you Tom. Bushy, absolute pleasure, looking forward to it. Absolutely mate. Now uh, a lot of South Australians are aware of you and, and how well you do in the real estate sector but for those that haven't had a chance can you tell us a bit about who you are and what you do mate? Yeah so my career began going back nine years ago now so 10 years ago I was actually at school at Ross River College which is a in the northeastern area of Adelaide and I went to a, a college called Ross River um, Catholic education there and I competed in a schools auction idol program where I competed against other school kids throughout South Australia for a junior golden gavel competition now at that time, I was planning on being a plumber, of all things, and uh, chose that uh, to give this auction idol a go. And I ended up winning that competition in 2008, Wallace's in year 12. And then from there, 
it really all just snowballed. I got a job at Toop and Toop Real Estate in 2009 where I worked in all parts of the business. But then I soon worked out that at the age of 18, I wanted to become a salesperson. I just absolutely loved the thrill of the chase. I loved how the money was uncapped and you could work when you want and uh, you create your own lifestyle. So here I am going back, uh, obviously, nine years forward, or nine years forward, I should say, bushy. And I've just sold 207 properties last financial year um, and uh, written a, a large volume of sales commission. So business couldn't be better, um, but it's taken a lot of sweat blood and tears to get there but i absolutely love it yeah fantastic man now that's something you said there you were you were thinking about going down the the plumbing path uh th- that's a quite a, a different journey to going down the real estate path what what can you take us back to what you were thinking at the time when you thought i'm gonna have a crack a go at that that auction competition yeah the reason i had a really hot had red hot crack at that auction program back in 2008 was purely around the fact that I always love speaking um, in front of big audiences and I absolutely love talking to people. So if anyone knows me personally, I ask a lot of questions. So people say to me after a half an hour conversation, well, I know a lot about you. Um, I know you know a lot about me, Tom, but I don't know much about you. So, but you know what? That's what I'm good at and that's why I've had great success in this business. So not everyone is going to love me. I know that for a fact and that's just business and I'm pretty intense. But at the same time though, I just love finding out about people's lives. I really do. Yeah, fantastic, man. And, that, and the was property part of your family upbringing? Was that was that something that was sort of in your blood, or you you'd been exposed to early? Can Definitely. So that? when I was when I was about fourteen, fifteen, I used to go to open inspections with mum. Uh, mum had a really, really, really passion for property at a young age. Dad was more in the share market because he worked in the bank for thirty two years, okay. whereas mum always wanted to invest and renovate properties and flip them. So I used to go to a number of open inspections with mum when I was fourteen, fifteen, and then that's how I got to know real estate. But anyone that knows my personality is that I'm not mediocre. I wasn't born on planet Earth to be mediocre. So if I go hard at something, I'll go very, very hard to be the best in what I do. So I was a tennis player when I grew up um, and I was obviously okay at it. I was never going to play Wimbledon or become the next Leighton Hewitt, but I loved it. I was very passionate about it and that's the way I've looked at real estate now. Yeah, fantastic. Well, let's take us through that uh, journey in real estate because it's it's a a grueling industry. Uh, It chews and burns quite a few and that that early few years is the make or break stuff uh, in in any commission based industry uh, a lot of people don't make the distance talk us about how you got through that and what what are the things that have been foundational to the, your success so far? Yeah, the, the biggest success I've had in the last nine is always having a good mentor. So if you don't have a good mentor, whether you're becoming a doctor, whether you're becoming whatever profession you're in, if you don't have someone you can look up to and strive to be or work from them, it's always hard to get to that next level. So I was lucky enough to meet Phil early on the piece in um, 2009 while I was at Toop and Toop and then he really taught me the craft and taught me the skills to become a top performing agent because so so many agents in South Australia are so mediocre. They don't train their craft. So I wanted to become a true professional versus just becoming an amateur. So I think that was a great part of my success in the early days because in the first two years, we call it suicidal. Like it's literally <laughs> suicidal. It's yeah. week to week, day to day. And every opportunity you get, you're up against two, three, four other agents. There's no free kicks. And more importantly, you're working 60, 70, 80 hours a week for a little to next to nothing. So I can see why people quit and they don't see the bigger picture. But real estate's all about lifestyle. So once you've been going for three or four years and you've got a good establishment, real estate can be very good for you. But the problem is the first two years are just so difficult. Yeah, yeah, no, no, extremely well said. So the the things that have sustained you and the things that have set you apart from other players in the game, given it is an extremely competitive and commoditized industry, uh, what do you think uh, that boils down to? For you, right? Yeah, number one is the prospecting side of it. So right. at the end of the day, if you don't, if you're not a prospector or you're not prepared to pick up the phone or smash on some doors or ring cold call at eight o'clock at night, yeah. um, from it from when you start in real estate or whether you start in any sales based profession, it's going to be hard for you to make it. Yeah. So my um, philosophy when I started was purely about outbound phone calls. Because right. at the end of the day, the outbound phone calls are going to result into something. It might not eventuate today. It might eventuate tomorrow. It might not eventuate for one year. It might eventuate in eight years. Yep. So I'm seeing the results now from when I've spoken to people back nine, ten years ago. But you know what? 
that takes time, it takes belief, and more importantly, this game is all mental. So the mental side of it's huge. If you can't sustain pressure, if you can't sustain rejection, yes. and you can't sustain long hours, it's just not for you. Yeah, that's a very good call. And I, I think it, that uh, very approach is applicable to any sales-type environment. So for those that are listening today that may not be in real estate but are in – other businesses where they rely on the sales to drive the business, then having that fortitude to handle rejection is is a real key because uh, particularly in the early days when no one knows, knows who you are, you're up against the trusted brands that have been around forever in that particular location. Uh, it's obviously only going to be the persistence that sees you through. But how have you been able to be strong enough to handle that rejection? Because a lot of people go, oh, this is too hard. I, I can't do that. Uh, I saw the bigger picture and I knew that if I consistently made the phone calls, something would eventuate one day. Yeah. And in the er- first two years, I was starting to get phone calls after 12 to 18 months. Yeah. So I was starting to see the return. So I knew the system worked. So once I saw the system worked, I said, you know what, if the system works like this now, imagine if I keep going, keep going and keep going. And all of a sudden, the snowball effects gets bigger, bigger, bigger and bigger. So when the market runs, you make a lot of money and you do extremely well. And you're obviously not just, it's not just all about the money. It's more about building good reputation, doing the right thing by people. But at the end of the day, it boils down to um, uh, consistently listing and selling a number of properties month in, month out. And if you look at my business now, it's very, very consistent. Yeah, fantastic. You've obviously built, it's sowed enough seeds to grow a pipeline that gives you that consistency. Uh, And that's the hard yards that you need to put in early. Now, I've heard uh, from a number of real estate gurus who talk about the fact that real estate isn't a game about property, it's a game about relationships. Uh, what's, what's your view on that and what's been your approach to building relationships in a pretty tough industry? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you're dead right, Bushy, that everything's about relationships. So if you love houses and you want to get into real estate, I don't think it's for you because you can be the best knowledgeable person um, in relation to knowing houses. But if you're not good at talking to people, you'll just never make it. Yeah. So all I do is try and build a real relationship in real time. So talk about their dogs, their kids, their holidays, whatever it may be. But at the end of the day, Um, I just love, absolutely love getting to meet people and working out what they do in their lives and how they live their lives. And that's why I've had good success because I'm actually intrigued by their scenario. Um, So when people ask, oh, what do they do? Like I know their whole life story because I ask a lot of questions. Brilliant. And then then you can have an ongoing dialogue about their personal life outside the property and And something to talk to them about. That's awesome. And that's why I've had good success is because I'm a people person. Mm. I'm very um, very easy to get along with. So at the end of the day, I don't – nothing phases me. Yeah. Yeah, no, that – absolutely excellent, mate. Now, uh, just uh, talking around that relationship side – uh, and I want to talk about this from both angles, both from a seller perspective, but also from a buyer perspective. Let, and let's take the seller perspective first, because that's ultimately your client, essentially. When you're uh, trying to secure uh, a particular listing, and you're uh, quite often a lot of people tie kick and will talk to a number of them, what is the conversation you have that, that gets them to say, Tom's the man, I'm not going to use X, Y, and Z? That comes back to the way in which a listing presentation is is conducted and more importantly, setting an agenda. So I talk about the four key components, which is the price, which is the strategy, which is the timing, which is the cost. And then more importantly, I talk about selling their property versus maximizing the price. Yes. So I've got some clear fundamentals that I can show that I understand the process of buying and selling houses. I talk about supply and demand. I talk about um, what you need to do to get a great price in real estate. So you've got to price it correctly, but you've got to present it beautifully and you've got to market it well so I understand the sales process and if you look at my competition a lot of them don't all they um, want to do is get the property sold for the quickest time frame and more importantly um, get the lowest price but at the end of the day my belief structure is fair that if you definitely present the property meticulously you market it correctly and you price it well it's going to result in a much better outcome yeah no, absolutely I'd, I've, I've from my own perspective, when when uh, going through that situation, Tom, uh, and talking to a couple of agents uh, over the years, uh, every vendor or seller thinks they've got the best property on the market and they think it's going to command the highest price. And I see agents coming in <coughs> and blowing smoke in terms of uh, 
just to try and to secure the listing and then spend the rest of the time trying to talk someone down on what they're going to get for it. Uh, what, what's what's your approach in comparison to that uh, to make sure there's a realistic expectation there? It's really, really hard and I'm struggling with that at the moment because the market's been so good the last 12 to 18 months and, and at the end of the day, um, they're always going to... I've lost listings multiple times before. I've been too conservative on the price yep. and don't get me wrong, I've always got it wrong. But at the same time is, I'd much rather get it wrong at the start rather than get it wrong three months down the track and then beating him down the head over every single week. Yeah. And, when, and that's happened to me before. I've got the price wrong before and the relationship with those vendors turns sour pretty quickly yeah, and it's very hard to build that trust back. So yeah. at the end of the day, no agent can dictate the price because if I was always correct on the price, the market would never go up nor would it go down. Yes. But at the end of the day, um, the consumer always wants to hold us accountable for the price they put on the property, which makes it very, very hard for us yes. to take price out of the picture. Yeah, of course. No, that's, that's very good. Now, a, a lot of uh, our listeners are investors, so they're more on the buyer side. But uh, for those that are holding a portfolio for uh, you know, 10 to 15 years, there will come a point at which they're going to rationalise that portfolio and they will do a sell down and, and convert that into cash flow. Uh, and they will need to be talking to an agent that they uh, are comfortable with and trust. What are the key things that they should be looking out for to secure a good agent and what questions should they be asking to satisfy themselves they've got the right person looking after them? I think the number one fact is having a good track record, so having experience because at yep. the end of the day, um, someone without experience in real estate can cost you a lot of money and and I mean that. So if they don't understand the process of how to negotiate multiple offer situations or conduct an auction or whatever that figure may be or price may be out there in the marketplace, yep. number two is you've got to have a good relationship with them. Yep. So it comes back to the way in which you have that meeting or that phone conversation with them so someone you can actually trust and knowing they're going to do the right thing by you and they actually generally care about you getting you the best outcome yes um and yep. more importantly, probably the most important factor is, you know what, you've got to go with your gut instinct. Like at the end of the day, it's your decision to sell your home, whichever agent you like. But the way in which I do business now is that people choose me because they feel comfortable with me. Yeah, okay. So again, it's that relationship building. Yeah, no, brilliant. Uh, sort of in parallel with that, uh, when I've, um, and I don't sell property very often because I'm a, a long-term buy and holder, but on the occasions that I have done, uh, in my mind, the key thing I'm looking for in a really good agent is their negotiation skill because uh, the property is the property and the market is the market. What's going to make the difference is the, the skill of the person in the middle negotiating the sale. And uh, what I've noticed is uh, some people who have come to see me in the past, the first thing they want to do is bend over on their fees and uh, try and try and secure the listing just by cheapness and what they don't realize in my head I'm going well I've you, you've just cut your throat because uh, you've you're already convincing me that you're not very good at negotiation uh, what, what's your your feeling on the importance of negotiation in that context absolutely imperative and that's the reason why at the end of the day we we focus on this every single day of the week in our job in particular and we always do role plays ensuring when we're in those situations we know exactly what to say in that in that situation so yeah. Bushy, you make a very valid point that at the end of the day, if an agent can't negotiate for you, they're not going to be able to get you the best possible price. Um, and I ask some clear questions. I ask some clear um, questions that I know that are going to um, influence the buyer from paying more for the home. And I've been taught that over a number of years. And that comes through by doing a lot of sales. The more yeah. and more sales you do, the more experience you get. Yeah, of course. No, it's spot on. Awesome. Well, let's let's flip it then and, and look at it from the buyer side because... Uh, a lot of buyers have this basic distrust of, of selling agents because it's like, oh, he's, he's uh, only looking after the vendor. He's not really uh, likely to be looking after me. How, how do you uh, get the confidence and the trust of the, of the buyers who will eventually become sellers? some point anyway. I just What's get the rules there? up front now, Bushy, really, really clearly up front when I choose to start the negotiation. So I always ask the question saying, if you want to buy this property, it may take time. It's not going to happen today. It might happen tomorrow. It might take a week. It might take a few days. But if you're prepared to work with me, I'm prepared to work with you to try and help you buy this property. And then again, I'm really working out the motivation of why they'd like to buy that property. Right. Because once I've got the motivation, 
that's going to can work out whether or not how much it's going to spend and if they're going to push keep pushing the price up or they're going to remain very very firm on their price yeah no that's that's a great advice the uh, there's a growing role for buyers agents and and the buyers advocacy exercise uh, emerging particularly for investors who are time poor and want an independent set of eyes and ears to start helping them secure a, a uh, portfolio uh, what's your view on the buyers uh, agency role in the industry uh, how good bad or ugly are they and is is that something that investors should be taking on board as part of their team? everyone's got their own opinion on on how buyers agents work and whether they're good for the industry or not my philosophy is clear right if you're going out there and buying an investment property right i think you should have some idea of what you're doing at the end of the day you're not going to know exactly everything but i wouldn't be wanting to go and spend six hundred thousand dollars on trusting somebody else now with the internet these days like realestate.com domain.com you can order so much information at the drop of a hat right yeah. so if you i know people are time poor but if you're prepared to spend a few hours on the internet you can actually work it out for yourself versus paying an, a buyer's agent 10 or fifteen thousand yeah. dollars so the way in which i'd look at it i'd negotiate myself even though you're time poor but you know what it's going to save you money and then at least you know what you're getting yourself into yep yep the, i guess the qualifier there for me is that uh, there are a lot of people who one they're time poor two they aren't good negotiators and therefore a little bit at the mercy of the market uh, versus a situation, I think you're a bit of a rarity in that, and I can talk firsthand here in relation to investors who uh, we've come to you and said, right, this is what they're looking for. Uh, what can you find for us? So you've in, in effect sort of quasi played that role anyway. Uh, can you talk us through a little bit more about your approach on that side? Because you're a bit of a rarity in the fact that for the right buyer, stroke investor, you do go the extra yard to uh, look for them rather than just focus on the vendors. Definitely, definitely. And if you have a friend, you don't have to use a buyer's agent. You might have a friend that's a good negotiator. I've had a lot of people like that before in my last nine years of real estate. They've got a friend buying the property for them to negotiate the best deal. Um, So you might get someone involved that knows real estate so they can help you in that regard. Um, But in relation to helping a buyer buy a home, right, I'll always try and um, be very transparent about the scenario. Yep. Like at the end of the day, I know how hard it is buying a property because I've bought a home myself. Yep. You're very, bl- it's very blasé because you don't know what the other offers are at. You don't know where to pop, what to spend, yep. and it's all behind closed doors if it's for sale. Yep. So you've got to step them through the process and just really, really have a relationship where you don't want to muck them around. Make it fair for everybody, and if you don't make it fair for every buyer, that's when problems evolve. Yeah, yeah, good call. Now I know you're a very good auctioneer in your own right Uh, and and from my side of the fence uh, Tom when we're talking to investors uh, we often say to them look if you can avoid an auction do so because a good auctioneer is going to draw on the emotion of the crowd and there's a fair chance you're going to pay a lot more for the property than what you should and can Uh, and you're also locked into auction conditions and unconditional on the hammer and 30 days to settle Uh, so we generally steer investors in the way of either making an offer prior or waiting until it gets passed in and making an offer after. What's what's your view and suggestions to investors who have a similar fear of the emotional side of auctions and what, what should they do about it? The only thing about buying a property before an auction is that you never know how many other offers are on the table, right? Yep. And you don't know if you're paying too much for the property. Yeah. The best thing about a public auction is you know your competition. Yeah. So if you're the only bidder, you've got the best negotiation rights versus there could be 10, well, then you know there's lots and lots of interest. So my philosophy is auction's the best scenario because it's very transparent. Yep. For an investor, especially when they want to buy the property for a very good price to make some money, you don't want to be paying too much for it before the auction. No. And you've got to have that way of just saying, you know what, that's my number, take it or leave it. Yeah. Yeah, no, perfect. Okay. Um, let's let's turn to your uh, personal journey now for a minute and uh, look at uh, what you've invested your time, energy, and money today. And I'd, uh, if you can think back to what was the first dollar that you personally invested and, and how did that go? 
in real estate? Uh, it can be any, in anything, mate. Yeah, well, interesting story. I'll tell you a great story. I bought a unit when I was in 2010 um, in Salisbury next yep. to the Holdens plant, oh, yep. two of two Perez Avenue in Salisbury. Yep. I paid $139,500 for that property. <laughs> It rented for I think about one hundred and eighty dollars a week at the nice, time. Great yield. So I was bought. I was nineteen at the time, um, and then two years later, I worked out that number one, I paid too much for the property, yep. and number two is that uh, the market was never going to go up in that area. Yep. So my accountant at that time consistently was telling me to sell that property. I then. Um, Finally decided in 2013, enough was enough, and I ended up selling that property for $110,000. Wow. So I lost a substantial amount of money. Having said that, the reason I want to bring this up today mm. is because not everyone's perfect. Mm. And there's absolutely no way that everyone's going to be rich or successful in life from their decisions they've made. Right, you yep. win some, you lose some. Yep. Versus my other property, I made a hundred thousand dollars on my unit in Leebrook. So, with that in mind, all I want to say today is that Bushy exactly knows where to buy. You got to trust him, but at the same time, you've got to. I, I didn't do enough research. I was too gun ho about it, yep. and that's why now I chose to sell it. But it was the best thing possible because probably now it's worth a lot less. Yes, you know, that's a good call. There's a there's an opportunity cost there that uh, some people will hang on and hang on and hang on and it never goes anywhere. But what they're costing themselves in capital growth, if you're a capital growth investor, is anywhere between two grand and five grand a week if you're holding a property long term. That's a conversation we often have with potential investors around that. So uh, yeah, and, and I would I really appreciate you sharing that experience because there's a perception that uh, good people in property are always making good decisions. And I was no different, but my, my first property purchase was a one into four build in Alice Springs. I was an architect. We spent a fortune because we we're going to win an architecture award. Wrong reason to be doing it. Uh, so cost was too high. Uh, wrong time in the market. Uh, we did, it, did dough on that. And best thing that's ever happened to me because it really forced me to have a bloody good look at what what successful property investments are all about and then to start assembling a process and the people I needed to help make that happen. So I appreciate you doing that, mate. Um, let, let's talk more about your property journey then. Uh, so uh, you've invested in other properties since. Can you take us through? Yeah, so for me now I've got – my uh, property I sold going back about 16 months ago in uh, Lee Brook. I had a two-bedroom home out there in a small group. It sold for a, a very, very good price of over a half million dollars for a two-bedroom home at in a small group of four. Yeah. Um, it was in a prestigious location and it was um, completely renovated. But now um, I've got some share in Harris Real Estate, so all my money's gone into this business. Yeah. And I've also just built a home in Erindale. So I've built a contemporary uh, double-story, double-garage um, home with a lap pool on a park, which is beautiful nice. and I could not be happier there so at the moment that's getting great capital growth yep. and they'll be there for a long period of time because I work extremely hard and I'd love to I love coming home to a nice home at night yep. so if my philosophy is now is I've got Harris real estate I've got my principal place of residence yep. and then I'd like to obviously buy and invest in the next few years but at the moment my money is going in towards Harris for another two or three years and then after that I'll look at diversifying yeah no that, that's perfect and I, I, I often say to people that um uh Far too many Australians, Tom, uh, invest in just their income. And I had this conversation around the difference between being rich and being wealthy. And a lot of Australians are rich. But the key question is, and I'll ask this question of you, Tom, if your income from the business was to stop today, how long could you sustain your current lifestyle? Because that's the difference between being rich and, and wealthy. Totally agree. I think about that all the time. Mm. Um, at the moment, I've got a definitely one to two years um, in in, in awesome. savings, so I'm awesome. doing extremely well. Very so well. I've I've done very well, mm. but um, I'm definitely a far off from where I want to be. Yeah. Um, and I think about passive income all the time. That's right. all I think about because yep. the passive income stream. So in probably 12 months, which is probably not long enough, but at the same time, it's a lot better than more, most people in Australia. Most, most people I talk to are a couple of paychecks away from disaster. So uh, you're, you're in good shape there. Now let's, sort of extracting from that, let's talk about, in your mind, what is your ideal lifestyle? How different is that from today? And what are you going to invest in that's going to help you get there and then sustain that uh, lifestyle income 
long term? Yeah, so for me, I want to have some property. I definitely want to have some property in the next five years. So whether it be land with an old house in it, whether it be brand new properties, I'm in the process of just working that through at the moment when I get some capital together to, to do that. Mm. And then I also want to have the share in the business. And then I want to play around with some super. So at the moment, I've got a self-managed superannuation fund and I'm obviously setting that up for the, for the future as well. So yep. I'm in a syndicate at the moment um, in Melbourne and I've bought into a, a big syndicate over there in a big commercial warehouse that's getting me a decent yield. Um, and I want to keep putting more and more money into that at the moment. So I just want diversity. All my portfolio is all about diversity yeah. and give me a dividend for a number of years. Yeah, now perfect. Awesome. Okay. Um, I want to come back now to uh, your experience in the investment sphere from an agent perspective because you'd be getting to see uh, investors both as buyers and sellers. And I want you to think about those that, that you have been able to perceive are very good at it and this is distill for us why you think they're good and what sets them apart from a lot of the other players in the game. The investors? Mm. Yeah. The, the, the people that I'm seeing at the moment that are making good money investing in property are the ones that are prepared to buy and hold, yeah. right, for a start. Because at the end of the day, there's no quick capital growth in Adelaide in the last few years, no. only in some very few locations. Mm. Um, and number two, they're very, very ruthless about the number in which they purchase the property for. Yes. They don't get carried away. Yeah. Too many people get carried away saying, I need to buy that particular property or I need to buy it today. What happens if you wait a few months? It's not going to make a big difference because if you overpay, you've lost all your chance of making any money bushy. Yeah, absolutely. It's, a, it's the old saying, it's not what you sell a property for, it's what you buy it for that makes the difference and the smart operators are are good at being able to pick that up. So that's that's uh, great advice on, the, on that front, mate. Okay, uh, slightly different pivot now. Uh, if you look at your journey so far, and it can be work-wise and personally, what has been your biggest challenge in your life so far? And what have you learnt from that, mate? My biggest challenge is probably having consistent belief. Like it's been, there's been times where I've wanted to quit. Absolutely no doubt, Bushy. Yeah. Um, it's been, the pressure's been too immense yeah. and the work hours have been so high and trying to balance that with everyday life is very difficult. Now, I'm fortunate that I don't have kids at the moment. Um, I was in a relationship, but I'm no longer in a relationship. But with that in mind yeah. is that um, uh, balancing act is the hardest. So that's been the biggest challenge. Yeah. And then more importantly now, it's about getting my work-life balance to a point where I can sustain this for a number of years. Yes. Well, let's talk about that because uh, you and I have talked about this previously. I burnt myself out as an architect and cost me my marriage and uh, I was at ground zero again in my uh, mid-30s. What are you going to do uh, in terms of your rituals, in terms of your approach that's going to make sure that you become a marathon runner, not a sprinter? And I'm doing it at the moment. I obviously have um, a morning off a week now. Uh, More importantly, I never, ever, ever work a Sunday. So you can't catch me on a Sunday. So I'll work five and a half days, right? And you won't catch me. I'll get a massage once per week. Like I've got some serious rituals. I've got a massage once per week. Um, I I consistently keep myself fit. Um, My health is everything to me. So when I'm not healthy, I'm not I'm not happy, and more importantly, I just try and um, really work my diary so I'm not getting home at nine o'clock every night. I might chunk my diary to certain days so I'll get home early one or two nights a week versus five nights a week. Yeah, brilliant. The uh, that's a real rarity. T- taking off a Sunday and half a day during the week for someone in the real estate industry is very rare. Uh, have you built up a team that enables you to do that or what are the things that you've implemented from a technique, a process, a people perspective Definitely. that's allowed So we've got you? four team members in, in the Hector team. So four plus me makes five. Yeah. So all these people have got individual key roles in our, my business to ensure that we um, perform on a highly high basis every single year. Yeah. And that does allow me to obviously work smarter, not harder. So yeah. I delegate a lot more now than I ever have. Brilliant. I need to do the stuff that matters the most, which is list property, negotiate, and more importantly, um, put out spot fires. Yes, yes. And if you've got the time to do that, you can do that with, with greater justice. But it's a, it's a, if you, someone who is a perfectionist, which you obviously are, and uh, have that patience and persistence, letting go of that control is a pretty tough thing, Tom. Because uh, I'm, I'm speaking from experience here because I'm a, a closet control freak myself. How have you been able to 
uh, let go and uh, enable your team to, to take up a, a lot of Great question, Bushy, because um, I got taught this from a young age from Phil Harris. Right. Phil's very, very good delegator. Right. And that's how he's built such a big business in such a short period of time. He's been made to look good and he's obviously got the ideas, but he's got people doing all the work for him. Yeah. So my philosophy is I'll do the stuff that I'm good at, which is obviously the prospecting, which is a listing, yeah. and I'll let people do the stuff I'm not good at and I've just got to have trust in them knowing that they're going to do the right thing by me. Yeah, brilliant. That, that's fantastic. And, and having that self-awareness to do that is the first step in all of that. Okay. Um, again, changing tack uh, slightly uh, in this regard then, uh, if we look at the uh, investor space, and I'm talking now about the South Australian market because you're very active and right across what's happening in that perspective. If I was to come to you as an investor and I had somewhere between, say, five or $600,000 to spend, I'm looking, uh, it's all about long-term capital growth for me. Now, the yield's not so important at this stage. It's all about growing that capital base. Where and what would I be buying here and now? Perfect. Let's let's get into it. So from my perspective, all the capital growth in the last nine years that I've seen in real estate has all been from blocks of land that can be subdivided with old houses on them. Yeah. So Windsor Gardens, like you could buy nine years ago a home there for 300 grand, they're now worth 500 grand. Yeah. Land's gone up substantially. Yes. Ross Trevor, Campbelltown, Newton. Um, I think at the moment, the, the hot spots to definitely to, to consider are um, uh, Modbury. Modbury's because of the rezoning up there. Yep. Um, Redwood Park in particular. Yep. You can buy a b- double block there for about three, 320. Yeah, okay. And there's absolutely no question that you're not you're going to see growth down the track. Yeah. yeah. So you're not going to get the best yield, but you know what? You can always do something with that property as well. You can subdivide it. You can build on one, sell one, et cetera. Yeah, and, and, and from our perspective uh – we're right on in line with what you're talking about there because if you redevelop and you build because of the depreciation benefits that you can still achieve on a new build exercise, that, that ongoing holding cost is dropped by a factor of 10. So it's almost, you can ask, almost cash flow neutral a property if you're building it and taking advantage of the land content because uh, it's the land that's going to give you most of the growth over time. And the, like, like, no, you know this better than I, but 80% of uh, the growth in the property comes from the location and the land. So, uh, yeah, I love that. And, and I, I guess what you're reinforcing there is that scarcity in and around the uh, north and eastern suburbs where they're not yep. making any more land yep. uh, is uh, pretty prime in terms of that sort of price point that we're talking about. Definitely, yep. Mm. yep. We're seeing a huge amount of people making good money in those areas. Mm. Yeah, so that's awesome. the buy and hold strategy is very, very good in those areas. Yeah. And anywhere, anywhere where there's good land and you've got old houses on them within 10 kilometres Adelaide CBD. So like Royal Park at the moment down the western suburbs, you've seen great capital growth down there. West High Marsh, Torrance, it was gone through the roof. Yeah. If you keep going down Torrance Road though, there's more and more opportunities becoming about, even like your Enfields and your Clearview, your Kilburns, yeah. great areas to invest. Yes. Yeah, for, for exactly the same reasons. Uh, for, for those, of, a lot of people are coming to us talking about all the incentives that uh, people are offering them to buy inner city apartments. And I, and I won't colour the discussion with my views on that, but I'm very interested in your views on uh, yeah. if someone came to you on that. Score. My whole philosophy around that is purely around asking them two questions or one question in particular, I should say. Um, or are you buying it for a lifestyle or are you buying it for an investment? Mm. So if it's lifestyle and you're going to live in that apartment, completely yeah. different story Yes, because you're going to enjoy it. Yeah. But if you want to buy an apartment for an investment, it's the worst move ever. Yes. Can you share why you think that? Because you'll get good cash flow and you'll always get good return, but you'll never, ever, ever get capital growth. And you've got high strata fees. So overall, the property's never going to go up yeah. and it's going to be a concern for you long term. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. No, that's Steer away apartments and yeah. units at the moment. Yeah, There's no totally capital agree. growth. Absolutely, totally agree. Now, it's good to hear from uh, – I share your views, but it's always good to hear from someone who's uh, got the sleeves rolled up and, and hands dirty with what's going on in the industry. Uh, the, the, the future of Adelaide then, because uh, you know, there's a lot of people that continue to poo-poo Adelaide as, uh, and we, we're often seen as the, the joke of the party in the eastern states in particular and we're the butt of a lot of jokes. Uh, you know, I, I, I think Adelaide's the country's best kept secret, quite frankly, from a consistency perspective. But what's your view on what's going to happen to the uh, the market over the next 
two or three years time. Yeah, my philosophy is pretty clear. We're going to see between two and three percent capital growth across the whole of Metropolitan Adelaide. Yep. Other pockets will see better capital growth than others, yep. but it's definitely not going to go backwards. The property market, yep. it might just not go up as quickly as it has gone up in the last three to five years. Yep. But at the same time, though, there's going to be consistent capital growth. Yes. So we're not going to see the slumps and bumps like Melbourne and Sydney. So for all those investors listening today, Adelaide, buy some land, sit on it for five to ten years, and watch it go up. Yeah, it's spot on. Absolutely dead right. Uh, okay, no, that's good. Um, all right, I, I want to jump into what I call the ambush part of the podcast. And what I mean by that is some short, sharp questions that uh, on topics that I know the listeners are interested in having a listen to. Sure. Uh, so let's start with uh, what's your favourite quote and why? That's a tough one. Um <laughs> Probably the Henry Ford quote, um, if you think you can, you can. If you think you can't, you can't. Yeah. So at the end of the day, he's dead right. Yeah. It's all the mental side of it. Yeah. And at the end of the day, if you are, if you, there's always a will and there's a way. So I always consistently refer back to that one, Bushy. Yeah, no, that's a, a, it's a great one. Uh, all right, uh, following on from that then, what's the top book and or top podcast that you would recommend someone both read or listen to and why? Probably the best book I've read when I first got into real estate was a book called You Inc by John McGrath, yep. right? And it just talks about you as a brand. Yep. And it talks about, probably not for all the listeners out there, it's, it was one more for me as as it changed my life. Yep. Um, and it talked about how you are a brand every day of the week. So it's not Harris Real Estate, it's Tom Hector. How are you perceived? Yes. So that book in particular changed my way of thinking mm. consistently. Mm. Um, so that was phenomenal when I first started. I couldn't put the book down. Um, it always resonates with me when I see that book or I listen to John McGrath because he's just the pinnacle of our industry. Yeah, he is. Yeah. Um, and, and probably the, the podcast, there's a couple of people that I have obviously um, really, really worked closely with over the last 10 years of real estate. Um, one of them being Anthony Robbins, who no doubt most people have met yep. and se- or, or seen, and number two being Robin Sharma. So um, a guy who's a motivational speaker as well. So they do do podcasts, but from my perspective, um, very, very uh, good people at working the mind. Yeah, no, perfect. Awesome. Um, now, this one's a little bit left field, but it, it's a, a bit of a personal hobby horse of mine, Tom, uh, because I'm still of the view that a lot of Australians uh, pay way too much tax. So uh, what's the top thing that you've done to reduce the tax that you pay? And, and I'm, I'm talking stuff that you can talk about legally here, obviously. <laughs> I'll have a good accountant for a start, yep. a very good accountant. So I always um, work that very effectively. Yep. And then and then more importantly, um, I just uh, – I always play by the book. I play by the book, Bushy. Yep. So at the end of the day, I pay far too much tax. Yep. And I'm always looking at diversifying that down the track. But – I, buy, I bought the investment property in Salisbury for a reason, so I can use it as a capital loss for a long time now, but yep. I don't really have the, the correct answer for that. I'd love to say bushy, but I just get a good accountant. Yeah, I think that is a good answer because a really good accountant and someone particularly who understands property as a co- as opposed to just doing a tax return can put a lot of money back in your pocket. I know that from first-hand experience. So, I know that's the good advice. Okay, um, Turning that investment sphere again then, what's the worst and the best piece of investment advice you've ever received? Oh, the worst one is probably um, having people say that uh, you can get on get on these schemes where you can go and buy a property with tips, for an example, out in Manapara West, <laughs> and then in 10 years' time, the property's going to be worth $100,000 more, and you might be making lots of money. That's probably the worst investment because I've seen firsthand of what that's actually done, mm-hmm. and it's actually killed a lot of people. Yeah. So, and the best tip of advice I'd give for most people is um, I buy and don't reinvent the wheel and be patient. Be patient. Absolute key. I, I totally agree with you. It's a, a subject that I talk a lot about, and, and we, we've mentioned this before, how we live in the iPhone uh, instant world, and therefore the patience and persistence exercise tends to fall by the way. Uh, in terms of investors that you've seen over the years, uh, what sort of time frame do you think that uh, – uh, investors are ideally seven to nine years. You got to look at it, Bushy. Yeah. Any yeah. shorter than that, 
you're not going to see a return. Yeah, and I, I, I personally would have said even that's pretty shy. Uh, if we look at property cycles around the country, it generally runs from eight to 15 years. So I generally say to people, look, if you're in it for 15, you're definitely going to go through a full full cycle because it doesn't go in a straight line. It, it goes in peaks and troughs. Uh, so, uh, But seven to nine years, for a lot of people, it even feels like too long. The good thing is if you set the property upright and you just focus on your career and the property is just doing its own thing in the background, it's not impacting lifestyle, salary or savings, then uh, it can happen all by itself. So, no, that's awesome. Um, all right, um, final part of the ambush. Uh, what's a personal habit that contributes to your investment success? Earning good amounts of income. Yes. So I've got high income and that's purely based upon being good at what I do. Yep. And income produces more revenue and more more wealth. Yeah. Yeah, it's spot on. And as a flow on from that then, uh, if you look back at your life journey so far, mate, what, what do you think is the thing that you've invested the most in? And it can be time, skills, money, you name it. Oh, it's definitely time. Definitely time. Yeah. Time of doing real estate. Yeah. It's taken a huge toll, but yeah. you know what? The financial reward's been there. Yes. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Uh, well, let's look to the future then. What's new and exciting and uh, happening in the Tom Hector world that people are going to be interested to hear about, mate? Yeah, so for the next 12 to 18 months, my um, my journey is going to be all about growing my team better and better every day. Yeah. So I want to become still a great real estate agent, still sell lots of property, yeah. but I want to work with great people around me and grow them into the next Tom Hector. Yeah. So yeah. that's mo- what I'm about now right. and purely having more of a, just a balance. Yes, yeah, which is always a challenge. Uh, any final tips then for listeners and, and given that with an interest in property – and potentially investment. Any final things that you suggest that people think yeah, about? Yeah, for all the listeners out there listening, um, just really, really understand the psychology and the the the, 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 the correct behaviours to become a good property investor. Number one is time. Just think about that. Just think time. Number two is always buy something that you can actually add value to, okay? Mm. At the end of the day, anything in a high, big high-rise building or a big block of units, you're only ever as good as your last sale, so if you are, something can add value to it's always going to make you more money. Yeah. And number three is take the plunge, take the risk. Because yeah. in two years' time, in five years' time, in ten years' time, you'll kick yourself saying, why didn't I do? Why didn't I do that? Why didn't yes. I do that? Yeah, no, brilliant. Absolutely. There's a lot of uh, procrastination by analysis paralysis uh, trying to find the perfect property that never happens, mate. So it's, it's very good advice. And time is the, the key to that. So that's awesome. All right, mate. Well, look um, – for those that want to get in touch with you, either to sell a property or to talk to you about your expertise in the, the property market and where it's ha- happening, how do they do that, mate? More than happy to contact me any time of the day. My mobile phone's always on. I'd love to catch up, whether you're buying, selling, or even investing in a property in real estate. Uh, I can get contacted on zero four two three seven six seven nine six seven, or you can send me an email at Tom H at harrisre.com.au. So would love to help where I can. I absolutely love real estate. Um, it's a real passion of mine. So I'll definitely steer you in the right direction. Yeah, fantastic. Tom, now, uh, I'd love the opportunity uh, to get you on more regularly to talk about the state of South Australia and where it's heading because people have a real interest in that. I, I do a number of Facebook Live bush bites on the property and finance arena. And the ones that get the most traction are those where I talk about what what the future of the market is. So uh, would be humbled if you were happy to come on board on a regular basis and join me with that discussion. More than happy at all, Bushy. Happy to help. Fantastic, mate. Been great to talk to you. Keep on keeping on. You're doing a fantastic job for the industry and uh, look forward to keeping in touch, mate. Thanks for listening. It's been a pleasure. How good was that? I hope you enjoyed it. To get a summary of all the investment gold and to get a copy of the show notes, email me on hello at khgroup.com.au. That's H-E-L-L-O at khgroup.com.au. Or check us out at www.khgroup.com.au forward slash get invested. And join me next week for another episode of the Get Invested podcast. Thanks for listening. And as always, dream as if you'll live forever and live as if you'll die tomorrow.